This man was a man whose name everyone knew about. He was famous, I guess we would say. He was someone who everyone knew what he had. He was wealthy. He had anything that he could ever want. He had lots of things, material possessions, monetary possessions, things that equated to value and worth. You name it, he most likely had it. And yet, this individual was also well known for another reason. A reason that is far more important, far more valuable than all of those other earthly and material things that he had put together. He was a man who is described to us as someone who was blameless. Someone who was upright. Someone who feared God. Someone who shunned evil. He was someone who was living his life according to the will of Almighty God. You know we're talking about the man by the name of Job. You see, Job was a man who was considered to be the greatest of all men in the East. He was a man who had seven sons. He had three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 1,000 oxen, 500 donkeys, all of these things adding up to people looking at him and coming to the conclusion that this was an extremely wealthy man. But it didn't last, did it? Soon after, as you read throughout Job chapter 1 and going into Job chapter 2, we remember that Satan came to Job with the permission of Almighty God to essentially destroy the life of Job. His servants, they were killed. His animals, all of those raided and burned up. His ten children, dead. Everything that was of value, everything that was of any kind of worth, everything that meant so much to Job and to his life, it was gone. Tragedy struck the life of Job. I know that each of us, perhaps at different times in life, maybe perhaps more than once in life, we have had to experience tragedy. And I'm talking about true tragedy. I know sometimes we throw the word tragedy around. Sometimes we use it flippantly about things that I guess really don't matter. But perhaps when the tragedies in your life, maybe you have experienced the loss of a spouse. Maybe you've experienced the loss of a parent. Perhaps you've experienced the loss of a child. Maybe it was a loss of health. Maybe a loss of property. Maybe a loss of something that meant a great deal to you. The loss of something that was of great value and worth. What did you do? What did you do as you went through those tragedies? How were you able to go from one end of that tragedy and come all the way out to the end of that tragedy? What I want to discuss for a couple of moments this morning is I want to look at Job's response and how you and I should be individuals who respond to tragedy. How do we respond to tragedy? What do we do? What do how do we react? When these kinds of situations that we would never ever want to go through, when they approach us and they come into our lives, what do we do and how do we handle those kinds of things? In order to answer that, I want to look at Job's response here in Job chapter 1. And our scripture reading gave you just a little bit of a snapshot of some of the things that Job was having to go through. But I want you to pick up with me here in the very next verse, beginning in verse 20. Notice what Job says. After all of these things have happened, everything has been taken from him. His children, his servants, they've all been killed. The only thing he has left is his wife. And notice what he says. Verse 20, then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Notice the very next verse. This is the verse I want to focus in on this morning. Verse 21, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There are five things that I want us to consider this morning as we look at verse 21. We're just going to break this down phrase by phrase, and then the lesson will be yours. Here's number one. What should I remember and how I am going to deal and respond to tragedy. Number one, I must remember that naked I came from my mother's womb. 
Naked I came from my mother's womb. I doubt there are many of us who remember the day, the actual day that you and I were born. We don't remember that far back. Although I do hope that many of us, all of us as parents, would remember the day that our children were born. And I know that everyone talks about how cute little babies are. Um, but you and I know that when those babies are first born, they come out red and shriveled and they don't look all too cute, do they? My wife's probably shaking her head at me right now. Uh, but I, I, understand, I understand the value of, of a child, right? But when we think about a child being born, you and I know that as they come into this world, as they are born into this world, they come into our possession, what comes with them attached to their name? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We, you and I know that a child, when they come into this world, when they are born into this world, they are born with nothing that is within their own possession. No money, no clothes, nothing, no retirement plan. There is absolutely nothing at all that comes with this child whenever it is first born. Literally naked, we come from our mother's womb. And so as Job enters into this period of tragedy within his life, he's lost his possessions, he's lost his wealth, he's lost the lives of those who mean the absolute most to him. What is the very first thing that he understands when it comes to him and how he deals with his tragic situation? That he knows that when he was a child, when he was a baby, when he first came into this world, he came into this world without a single one of those things that had been taken from him just previous moments before. He's not putting any of those things down, is he? He's not taking away from the importance of all of those things, especially from the importance and the value and the worth of those lives that were lost. Yet, what does Job understand? Job understood that it, who it was that gave him those things. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Job understood that everything that he owned, it was something that he had acquired at some point throughout his life, and that it wasn't his because he was born with it. He understood that he arrived at nothing. Here's the second thing that I want you to think about as we go through this, and we're going to spend more time on this one. What's the second phrase that Job says? How do I deal with my tragedy? Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. You see, Job understood what was on the list of things that he brought into this world with him, didn't he? And he also understood, he also knew that that list of things held the same amount of things that he was going to take with him whenever it was that he left this earth. Thus, when it came to him dealing and handling with his tragedy, with his tragic situation, he knew that ultimately everything was going to leave him behind, or he himself was going to leave it behind when he passed from this life. He knew that he couldn't take anything with him once he died. Again, he's not downplaying the importance and the value of some of those things that he had, again, namely the lives of his children. But he also knew that when he died and when he was going to return to the Lord, those things could not go with him. You and I know from history, and we study the Egyptian culture, you know that certainly they had some strange beliefs, as we might say. You know that they thought different things about the afterlife, as they called it, uh, than, than what we understand. And you and I know that they would often bury their dead alongside all of their possessions. They would bury all of these things with their dead because they thought that in the afterlife, their dead were going to rise and they were going to be able to use all of those things that they decided to bury with them. Boy, you see, what these Egyptian people didn't understand was that when the human body, the temple that God has allowed us to temporarily possess, when it dies and when it gives up the ghost, Anything and everything that has any kind of earthly quote-unquote value immediately becomes non-important. All of those spices and food and wealth and money and furniture and things that they would bury alongside their dead, guess where all of those things still are if those tombs haven't been robbed and raided yet? They're still there, aren't they? They didn't get to be used with them in the quote-unquote afterlife. You see, they didn't understand what Job understood as it was helping him deal with this tragedy because Job knew that ultimately he was going to leave this earth with the same amount of things that he entered into it with. That being absolutely nothing. 
It makes me wonder about the value that we place on our quote-unquote things of value in this world. You see, if we came into this earth with nothing, and if our possessions are going to end at the stone that is there on our grave, then how important, how truly important are all of these quote-unquote things that you and I possess and that we own today? You see, it was John who said, and you know this verse very well, 1 John 2 and verse 15, what did John say? He said, don't love the world or the things that are in the world. That was the message that that rich young fool needed to hear in Luke chapter 12, wasn't it? You remember reading verses 13 all the way through verse 21, and what did he think? He thought he had built this great empire, didn't he? He thought he had built all of these things, and they were all going to be at his possession for the whole time that he was here on this earth. But what did God say? God says, Slow down. I've got other plans for you, didn't he? He says, even while you're planning to eat, to drink, and to be merry, guess how many of those possessions, all the things that you cared so greatly for, all of the things that you worked so hard for and that you were storing up for a great many years, how many of those things did you get to take with you, rich young fool? Not a one. I'm reminded of something else that John wrote. Continuing on in 1 John chapter 2, you jump to verse 17 How does that verse begin? John says, and the world is passing away. John, what are you saying? John says, look, what I'm saying is, I'm saying all of the things in this world, all of our material possessions, our monetary possessions, they are subject to decay and to destroy, aren't they? Jesus said so Himself. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where what happens? Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. The possessions of our lives, no matter how sentimental, no matter how valuable they may be, one day they are going to be destroyed. Just as you and I are one day going to be gone from this earth. So are all the things that you and I own. Which I guess in in some sense ought to be like a reality check for us, shouldn't it? As it comes to the way that you and I view our possessions. As it comes to the way that we view our things. I think far too often people place too much stock in the things of this world. Far too often we think about placing our hope and our trust and our value and our worth in the things of this world that are slowly but surely passing away and that will not last. I hope that you and I never lose sight of the fact that these quote-unquote things that we find so valuable and so worthwhile in our lives are one day going to be destroyed. You see, Job was an individual who had that mindset. He knew that he came into this earth with nothing. He knew that he was going to leave this earth with nothing. And he knew that everything that he acquired between those two timestamps all amounted to nothing. Someone once asked after the graveside service, well, how much did he leave behind for his family? And you know what the response was? The response was he left it all. You see, the only thing that we take into eternity with us is our soul. The only thing that each of us should concern ourselves with in this life is not how many dollar signs we can have, not how many letters we could have by our names, not how many deeds are in our name, or how many car titles we might could own. The only thing that matters is if we are in a good standing with Almighty God and His will for us. Here's the third thing I want you to think about. What do I remember as I deal with tragedy in my life? I look to Job, and Job says, number three, that it was the Lord who gave. Go to Psalm chapter 50 with me this morning. Psalm chapter 50. I'll meet you there in just a moment. I suppose the key to understanding how to cope with tragedies has to do with this fact right here. That it is the Lord who gives. Certainly Job had a strong worth ethic, didn't he? I don't think that all of his sheep and his donkey and all of those possessions, I don't think they were just sitting in a trust fund waiting for him to reach a certain age and then they were going to come into his possession. That's not how things worked back then. I am sure for the majority of those things that Job owned and that Job had to his name were things that he worked hard for. Things that he diligently worked hard to get and to own in this life. Job understood one simple fact, however, and it's something that you and I are better off remembering, that everything we have is because it was God 
who gave it to us. You see, everything that you and I own, everything that is tied to our name, anything that is of any value to our, in our possession, it is there, it is that way, because God has allowed us to have those things in the first place. Look, I know that we all work hard. Absolutely, we do. Academically, we work very, very diligently, don't we? To get degrees and to be able to have those kinds of things, to get those letters by our name. In the business world, we work hard in our jobs to get those promotions, don't we? So that we can rise to the top on the chain, so that we can be where we want to be in life. And I get all of that. And I understand that if you don't put forth the diligence and the hard work and the effort, you don't get any of those things. But you and I have to understand that before any of that, before any of those things ever happen or take place, that it is God who gives us the ability and the opportunity before anything else. That it is God who allows us to be able to do those things. It's God who deserves the glory. God who deserves the honor and the praise. What we have to be extremely careful with, and it has often been said before, that the right hand of pride is selfishness. The right hand of pride is often selfishness. The idea that I'm the one who's given myself all of these things. I'm the one who has worked so hard and so diligently to put myself in this situation that I am right now, and I'm the one who gave me all of the things that I own. I gave myself because of my diligent effort, because of my hard work, I gave myself those degrees. I got myself those promotions. I did this. I did this. And that selfishly, that's all we want to think, isn't it? Again, yes, it was you. You worked hard. It was your attitude of diligence that got you into that place in the first place. But something you and I have to keep in perspective, something that we have to understand and realize, is ultimately that without God, you and I would never even have the opportunity to do those things in the first place, would we? God is the one who grants us the ability. God is the one who gives us the opportunity to be able to do all of those things. One thing that you and I have to remember, and one thing that I see Job remembering here, is that ultimately what will help him and what help us through tragedies is the fact that it is God being the one who gives us those things because everything already belongs to God in the first place. In Psalm chapter 50, it was David who said, beginning there in verse 9, <clears throat> he said, I will not take a bull from your house, nor goats out of your folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. Verse 11. For I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all its fullness. God says, look, the beasts of the field, the cattle, the birds, everything that you see out there, He says it's all mine. You know why? Because I created them. I'm the one who put them there in the first place. God says all of this is mine because it was mine before it ever became an opportunity to be yours on this earth. And the sooner that you and I come to grips with the fact that we are so little, that we are so small, so helpless, so finite, compared to God and to His power and His might, the better off you and I are going to be. As we go through tragedies in life, remember that it is Almighty God who has given us the opportunity to enjoy those things in the first place. That it wasn't us, us ourselves. Here's number four. The Lord has taken away. The fourth thing that Job points out as it comes to dealing with tragedies that the Lord has taken away. I want you to go to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, and I'll meet you there again in just a moment. How many of you guys as you go there know what this scene is from in what particular movie? I'm sure many of us know. Sarah J is looking at it like she knows exactly what this is from. Finding Nemo, right? This is from the movie Finding Nemo. And you remember these seagulls? They're probably the most annoying character in any Pixar movie that has ever been created. But <clears throat> what they did, these seagulls, was, you remember in this particular scene, they're trying to eat the crab that has surfaced out of the water. But you remember later on in the movie that when Dory and Nemo, the two fish, they're trying to escape from the, I guess, notorious fish killer Darla, the little girl in that movie, right? When they're trying to escape, they jump out of the water and, or out of the window, and who scoops them up? Well, it's Nigel the big seagull, right? And he picks it up in his mouth, and he's flying off. Well, as he's flying away, do you remember what's happening? 
All those seagulls, they, they, they all jump off and they start flying around and they start chasing the two fish that are inside of the mouth of the bird. It's crazy. If you haven't seen it, you need to go see it. It's a great movie. But what is it that they are all screaming and yelling over and over and over again? It's the word mine. They're saying mine, mine, mine over and over and over again. I suppose that it's truly an unfortunate thing that you and I are living in a society where we are becoming more and more like these seagulls, aren't we? That in everything that you and I see, that in everything that we do, everything that we come in contact with, we think that it belongs to who? To us. We think that it belongs to me. That it belongs to me as an individual. That it's all about me, myself, and I. It's all about the things that I want to have, the things that, that I already have, and how can I keep them? How can I get them into my possession to where I can retain them for all of my existence while I'm here on this earth? What can I do to advance myself in gaining more and more and more when it comes to the things in this world? And I think we do that because I think you and I believe, at least in our world, that we are the ones who have control. But you and I have to understand this fact, that until we can truly trust in Almighty God, that it is then and only then when we are able to accept the fact that it is God who also has the power to take away. If you are someone who trusts in yourself, if you are someone who puts your stock, your faith, your trust in you and in you alone, then how do you feel when bad things begin to happen that you can't control, when those trials and those storms and those difficult situations in life come and you can't dictate or sway the way that the, the outcome of that situation, what happens? We begin to freak out, don't we? We begin to stress out because we are quickly realizing we don't have control. You see, you and I have to trust in God and trust in the fact that He has everything under control. And when we do that, you and I are able to take solace in the fact that sometimes it is God who takes things away from us. We have to remember that you and I are simply the clay that is being molded by the hands of the potter. What did Paul say in Romans chapter 9? Notice verse 20. But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the things formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What's he saying? The lump of clay doesn't get to question anything that's going on about it, does it? The lump of clay doesn't get to question the amount of clay that the potter adds or that the potter takes away. The lump of clay doesn't get to question anything. It's just simply that, the, that it is trusting in the potter. That the potter knows exactly what he is doing in order to make it and to mold it into what he wants it to be. It was Mark Posey who said this, how dare we lift up clay hands to heaven and question his works. You and I must remember who we are. Just exactly who we are when it comes to Almighty God and certainly that will help aid us through the tragedies of life. Here's the fifth thing that I want you to think about. What did Job say as he begins to wrap this entire thing up? All of these tragedies are going on. How do I deal with them? What do I do? Job says, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, and in everything that I've experienced, above all, blessed be the name of the Lord. Job, you've been through so much. You've gone from having everything that you ever wanted to having essentially nothing. To having everything stripped away from you, taken away from you unjustly, as we might say, because He did nothing wrong. Your family, your possessions, your health. And what does Job say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. In our minds, it doesn't make sense, does it? Job, think about it. It was God who gave Satan permission to do these things to you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But Job, it was God who gave Satan permission to kill your children, to take all your possessions, to kill your cattle. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, You're the one who 
gave Satan the ability and the opportunity to destroy Job's physical life. And what does Job say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. If there was nothing to learn from the outlook of the life of Job but one thing, this would be it. That no matter what situation is thrown your way, no matter what hand of cards you might be dealt, no matter what trial, struggle, or situation this world may throw at you, that in everything and through everything that you go through, blessed be the name of the Lord. You and I go through tragedies all the time. We go through situations and things that we never want to go through. We see our world go through all of these things every single day. How do we respond? Above everything else, remember, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because it is God who gives us the opportunities that we have, and it is God who takes those things away from us. God has given us the opportunity to come to Him, to be with Him one day, Despite all of the tragedies that we face, despite all the difficult situations that our world throws at us, we know that there is hope beyond this life. That's how you can get through a tragedy. Understanding that there is something far greater and far better than what this world has to offer you, that being an eternal home in heaven. Maybe, that you, maybe it's your decision that you want that this morning, but you know that you're not yet a Christian. Maybe you've been studying. Maybe somebody's been studying with you, and you know that you need to be baptized in order to be able to have that hope. Know that we can do that this morning. If you have any questions about it, please don't hesitate to ask someone, or, and they will, I promise you they will do all that they can to give you an answer. But if you want to put Christ on in baptism this morning, know that we can do that. We can assist you in any way. Maybe you're here this morning, and perhaps you are a Christian, but maybe your life's not what it should be. Maybe your faith isn't as, isn't as strong. Maybe there's sin in your life. And you need to get all those things cleaned up and you need to give your life back over to Almighty God. Know that you can come forward, repent of those things. We'll pray for you. We'll help you. We'll do all that we can. If you have a need this morning, won't you come? As together we stand and as we sing.